Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for making the weather so nice. Uh, it's been a while, and I know you took your time, but at least it seems finally to be here. Um, I'm going to give you a quick test right off the very beginning. So, is everybody ready? Name for me a 16th century mathematician. Descartes, 17th century. Oh, we got one over here. Cardano. There's a 16th century mathematician. Anybody else? Napier, 17th century. Pardon me? Okay, I'm going to call that person sort of an extension of Cardano. All right. <laughs> name, me, name for me a 17th century mathematician. Fermat, Newton. Anybody else? Leibniz. There are dozens of 17th century mathematicians you can name. Most people can't name a single 16th century mathematician. Why is that? Did nothing happen in the 16th century? Well, I'm going to try to convince you today that that, wasn't, that isn't the case. Historians of math are very proud of themselves right now. Uh, we think of ourselves as being superior to the historians of mathematics from about 50 or 100 years ago. And the reason is that we have become very sensitive to issues of how you express the mathematics, the language that you use. Um, and that by expressing historical mathematics, especially ancient math, in modern terminology, you are changing it and you are warping it and turning it into something different. Um, so we have been very careful to avoid that problem uh, so that we are not turning the history of mathematics into a study of what, how we understand mathematics. But at the same time, we, are having, we have a long way to go because at the same time we also still choose the subjects of the history of mathematics that fit our interests. You will find dozens of people working on the history of calculus and on history of differential equations, 19th century mathematics, because that is what we learned as the mathematics we studied in graduate school. So, what I would like to do is to try to break that down for you a little bit and start looking at some mathematics that maybe you haven't seen. It comes from the 16th century, the lost century. Are we ready? Okay. A little bit of background. I'm going to go further back than you might expect, at least to start off. All right, this is the night sky. Can you actually see it? Okay. Trigonometry started in ancient Greece when astronomers were trying to predict the motions of objects up in the heavens. But why do you think they were so, the ancient astronomy was so important, whereas physics, you never, you never hear about ancient Greek physics, do you? Or chemistry, or anything like that. The ancient Greeks um, were very, of course, whoops, there goes the sun. Everybody hold your breath, I'm going to remove the atmosphere. Motions up in the supernatural world, by supernatural I mean up in the heavens, they fit mathematics perfectly. What are the, what are the curves these, these stars are moving in? Perfect circles. Okay, this, this is where geometry comes personified to life around us, up there in the heavens. Down here on the earth, have you ever seen a perfect circle? Well, okay. <laughs> where in Flory, where have you seen a perfect circle? Ah, <laughs> uh, but it's not a perfect circle, is it? Okay, there you go. But in modern technology aside, um, down on the earth, things are corruptible. Things are uh, objects are affected by things that are as fleeting and difficult to predict as feelings. As uh, you know, you can make conscious decisions to change things, and so. Mathematics is a difficult tool to use to try to predict how this paper is going to fall because I might decide to push it halfway down or something like that. So there's a distinction between the mathematics down here and the mathematics up there. And up there is where the real mathematics exists. So does anybody know the father of trigonometry? Would you like me to tell you who it is? It is not Ptolemy, although Ptolemy is, is, is one of the major figures. It is, in fact, Hipparchus of Rhodes from about 250 years before Ptolemy. 
Um, as you can see, he is looking up into the heavens. Now, when you study trigonometry in high school, you're used to having somebody standing in front of a board, drawing the diagrams on this nice flat surface, and working from there. But when Hipparchus was looking up, he didn't see a flat surface. What is the shape of the sky? Sphere. It is a sphere. And so, in fact, in ancient Greek times, trigonometry was done more often on the surface of a sphere than it was done on a flat surface. And that is why you should all buy my book, Heavenly Mathematics. Uh, yes, well, you should buy my books anyway, but that's another matter. Um, because uh, this subject has vanished from the curriculum. Uh, it disappeared in the year 1955, which is a year I mark as a tragic moment in the history of mathematics. Um, ever since then, what you see in school today is just a mere little tip of the iceberg of the full glory that is the real subject of trigonometry. Um, so, trigonometry from ancient Greece moved on to, does anybody know? Pardon me? No? Just make a guess. Egypt, close? Well, no, not close. India! Okay. Um, in ancient Greece, they actually didn't have things that we might call trigonometry, the sine, the cosine, the tangent. These things didn't exist. So in ancient Greece, you have a circle. It's not the unit circle. It's a circle with a radius of some value. There were different numbers that were chosen. The function that the Greeks used was the chord. For this angle here, the function was the length of the chord across the circle down here. In India, this was soon discovered to be a rather awkward function. They kept on having to take half the angle and then cut the chord in half. And so eventually somebody said, why don't we just take this length here? And it, it, was, it, it is now called the sine. Don't ask me the story of why it's called the sine. It'll take me 45 minutes to exp explain it all. Um, notice that the sine is a length. It is not a ratio like we define it today. The other function the Indians used was the length from here to here, the versed sine, or reversed sine. Uh, if you look closely, you can see it's related to the cosine. But you will see no tangent, none of the other functions that we use today. Now, from India, trigonometry then moved into the Middle East, um, especially in the area of Iraq and Iran, a little bit into Egypt right here. This is around the year oh, 800, 900 AD, thereabouts. And then something very strange happens. Um, around the year 950, we're not entirely sure how this happened, the, the mathematics and astronomy, including the trigonometry, found its way across North Africa and eventually found its way into Spain. Now, Spain was a Muslim country at the time, so this, but what's strange about it is that the, what went across here happened around the year 950. Meanwhile, Iraq and Iran still continued to produce trigonometry, and up, up to the year 1500, they had a very sophisticated trigonometry. But what lived in Spain was this older stuff from about 950 AD, and it only had the sign and the versed sign. All the other functions, the tangent, secant, cot, secant, all these things, lived in Iraq and Iran, but never went anywhere else. So eventually, it spread from Spain into especially France, Germany, and Italy during the medieval period. And the trigonometry that we find at the beginning of the 16th century is actually an extended version of this sort of halfway developed theory that had originally come from the Middle East. And this is the fellow who wrote the book on the subject. He, I consider him to be the pinnacle of medieval trigonometry. His name is Johannes Regiomontanus. He was never actually called that during his life. This is a Latinization of the town that he originally lived in, Königsberg. Um, died at the age of 40. Uh, my students back at Bennington College had this really morbid habit. They would always 
choose a mathematician of the year who died at the same age that I happened to be that year. Uh, so a certain number of years ago, Reggio Montanus was the mathematician of the year. I'm not saying how many. All right. Um, he wrote this book. Um, let's see, if where is the title? It's always a bit hard to find the title on these things. Um, here it is, De Triangulis Omnimodis, on, on all kinds of triangles. And this book is a triumph of medieval trigonometry. It is able to solve every single triangle, whether it's an ambiguous case or not, whether it's a plane triangle or a spherical triangle. It can do everything using only the sign and the versed sign, because that's all he's got. And it's a wonderful book, and so trigonometry is finished. We can all go home, right? No. Okay. Here is his expression of the spherical law of cosines. In every spherical triangle that has been constructed from the arcs of great circles, the ratio of the versed sign of any angle to the difference of two versed sines, of which one is the versed sine of the sides of tending this angle, while the other is the versed sine of the difference of the two arcs, including this, you get the idea. OK, this is just the expression of the statement. Then he has to prove it. And that takes another four pages. In modern notation, this is the spherical law of cosines, where the little a, little b, and little c are the sides of the spherical triangle. Big C is one of the angles. And there are two, two difficulties, I suppose, with the way that Reggio Montanus expresses this. Number one, he is only using sines and versed sines. He doesn't have a cosine function, and so he can't even consider or express the theorem in this way. So he has to express it in this rather peculiar form, which, if you work on it a little, you can see is equivalent to the spherical law of cosines. Uh, if you do get bored later in the talk, you can try to puzzle it out, whether or not it is the same. The other difficulty, of course, is that we don't have any symbolic algebra, which means that you end up having to try to keep all of this in your head in words. And that is, of course, a great challenge. Nevertheless, this book became the standard book. Now, this book was printed in 1533, which is almost 70 years after Reggio Montanus died. But this is the beginning of printing. And so, and this is one of the things that's really subtle about this is that before printing existed, people would not have the same text to talk about. Somebody in Spain talking about a document might be working with a document that looked a little bit different than the one in France or the one in Germany. As soon as you have a printed text, you have a single text, a standard text, and a community develops around that text. Well, in trigonometry, the community that developed developed around this book. This book became the beginning point of knowledge. It's a little bit strange, actually, because there was a lot of increased trade with the Middle East at this time as well. Um, there was, especially in Venice and Genoa, there was all sorts of trade going on. You would have thought that this more advanced trigonometry from Iraq and Iran would find its way across to Europe. I don't have an explanation for that. I have a theory, which is that what happened in the Middle East was that a lot of the really top centers of research actually had shifted further east. And they were in Iran and is Uzbekistan and so on. And it would have been more difficult for that knowledge to come across. So Reggio Montanus, still working with this medieval mathematics, was the standard in the year 1533. Everybody thought the way Reggio Montanus thought. Until the next character came along. And then he tried to blow everything up. OK, I am going to tell you about this child. This child is not my son. I have no idea who he is. Um, what he found out, what Reg, when Reggio Montanus was working on this stuff, he, was, he found that he was doing the same calculation again and again and again. He was constantly taking the sine of an arc, and then he would divide it by the sine of the complement of that arc. Altogether now, what was he actually calculating? The tangent function, okay? 
There was a tangent function, sort of. It was called umbra, umbra recta and umbra versa. Does anybody know any Latin? What does the word umbra mean? Shadow. Okay. In this primitive trigonometry that had come from the Middle East, um, they had a function, which was the shadow. If you have a sundial, you, you need a small child for a sundial to cast a shadow. Um, you then need to know the ratio between the, the, the child's height and the shadow's distance across. And this is opposite over adjacent. So they did have a function called the tangent. Uh, they called it the shadow, but it only existed inside the theory of sundials. This is another one of these weird things. It never actually transitioned across into trigonometry proper. It lived just to create sundials, nothing else. But Reggio Montanus found he was doing this again and again and again, constantly taking the sine and dividing by the complement, the sine of the complement. And so in one point, in one of his trigonometric, or one of his astronomical tables, he decided, okay, I'm actually going to tabulate this thing because I'm sick to death of constantly calculating it. So he called this, he just is buried on page 299 of this treatise. He, he called it the tabula fecunda, the fruitful table. And he tabulated the sign over the complement of the, the sign of the complement and got these numbers here. And this is the first appearance of the tangent function in Europe. Now, it doesn't look much like a tangent function, right? The tangent of one degree is not 11,745. Um, however, uh, it is 0 0.011745. So what, what do we have here? We actually have um, a base circle radius that is not one. They didn't have a decimal system of numeration. Uh, with a decimal point and numbers after that at this point yet. So in order to calculate functions in trigonometry, what they would do is they would use a base circle radius that was a really, really big power of 10. Okay, In this case, the function is 100,000 times the function that we use today. You can see right there, the tangent of 45 degrees is 100,000. Okay. And when you do this, it means that, the, that you can approximate the tangent of anything as a whole number. Okay, It's a big whole number, but then you don't have to worry about those pesky fractions afterwards. And this is the beginning of the tangent function. People started to use it. It became, started to become popular. Then along comes our second character who said, yeah, please do. Yeah, that's right. What's actually happened there is a typo. <laughs> yeah, see, and a 15th century typo at that. Um, some, yeah, somebody actually put all these leading ones, because what would often happen is that scribes would actually write these things down one digit at a time, especially for the leading digit, because it's the same digit again and again and again. And somebody just made a mistake and went too many, had too many of them there. The weird thing is you find this in some printed copies and not others, which means that they must have typeset it more than once. Do you know how Reggie Mountain Montanas how did he calculate these? Ooh, I'm going to get to that a little later. Okay, I don't know specifically this table, but I do know some others that relate to it. All right, our next character comes along about 15 or 18 years later. And I don't know if anybody has heard of this guy. Anybody heard of Georg Redicus? A few of you. You have heard of... You, Redicus is very, very important to you. Because, <laughs> and because there is a very important person who you would never have heard of if it wasn't for Redicus. Redicus, when he was a student in Germany, heard of this crazy Polish guy who had this system. He's he working out back in the backwoods of Poland, you know, just totally obscure. And he had this system where he had this, the earth going around the sun instead of the sun going around the earth. Redicus decided to pursue this guy, went all the way to Poland, bugged him until he finally agreed to, to allow him to be his student. 
Uh, he must have been a real, real pain, this guy. He was just constantly pestering. Uh, okay, you all know who it is. Who is it? Copernicus. Um, actually, Copernicus finally allowed Reticus to write an introduction to Copernicus's system, the Neuratio Prima. And this is what, Co what Reticus is most famous for, the first publication of Copernican astronomy. Eventually, he convinced Copernicus to publish his grand book on the theory. The story goes that the proofs for this book landed on Copernicus's lap about two hours before Copernicus died. So if there had been no Reticus, there very likely would not have been a Copernicus. But Reticus was much more interested in trigonometry than he was in astronomy. And about six years after, or eight years after Reticus, after Copernicus died, Reticus publishes his first major work. It has almost no words in it at all. The Canon Doctrinae Triangulorum. It's nothing more than 16 pages of trigonometric tables. It's one of the most exciting read, bedtime reads you can imagine. <laughs> um, it is also one of the strangest books ever to appear on the Catholic list of banned books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was actually banned by the Catholic Church, uh, presumably because of his connection with Copernicus. Now, you will notice there's not a single word sine, cosine, or tangent, or anything like that on, this ta on these tables. The headings are completely obscure, so let me unobscure them for you. Reticus rejected the sine function. Now, so what he did instead was he had, he ended up with six functions. Sound familiar? How many basic trigonometric functions are there? Six. Well, now I'm going to put them together in a way you may never have seen before. You have a circle of radius r, again, 10 to some big power. The perpendicular of that triangle we call the sine. He's just going to call it the perpendicular of the first species. You then have a base, which we call the cosine. He's just going to call the base of the first species. Okay. That's when the hypotenuse is the radius. But why make the hypotenuse the radius? Why not make the base the radius instead? If you do that, it turns out the hypotenuse is equal to the secant, and the perpendicular is equal to the tangent. So what we call the tangent, he called the perpendicular of the second species. Guess what's going to happen in the next, next image? Make the perpendicular the radius, and then you get the cotangent and the cosecant. And there are all six functions in this nice, elegant system. And that's all there is. You've got all six trig functions. We're all, all at once. And now you can, you can see a little bit here. Here's the perpendicular and the base for the first species, hypotenuse and perpendicular for the second species, hypotenuse and base for the third species. So instantly, all at once, you've got all six trigonometric functions in this different new system. So what happens when you invent a completely new system like this that's wonderful and has obvious advantages? Nobody pays any attention. <laughs> and that is, unfortunately, what happened to our friend Reticus, at least at first. It didn't stop him. The fact that nobody paid any attention to him made no difference at all. He continued to work until the year 1574, when unfortunately he died. Um, but he also happened to have a student knock on his door the last year of his life. And that student actually finished the project 22 years later with the Opus Palatinum. Now, if you thought the first book was boring, uh, <laughs> this one is 700 pages of trigonometric tables giving this, all six trig functions to 10 decimal places for every 10 seconds of arc. Did it make it to the band list? It did not. Um, I tried to give an idea how big this is. This is, this is actually in the Dibner Library. 
This is half of the Opus Palatinum. That is a later set of trig and log tables right there. This book is about, I don't know, about that big and about that thick. And there are two volumes. There is, pardon me? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I wish I could remember. I mean, it was sponsored by Frederick, the, the, the Palatinate. Um, so I guess you'd call it, um, you'd call it state sponsorship. This is one page. You can see from 38 degrees, I can't even quite read that, 20, 20 minutes to 29 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, something like that. All six functions. It took, he didn't do this himself. Well, he did some of it himself. I can't, I, I never remember this. I'm going to have to look this up. He, I, he either had five assistants working 12 years, or he had 12 assistants working five years. <laughs> and I always get it backwards, which one it is. Mm -hmm. Did they standardize the length of the chambers? Did they standardize which? Their lengths, right? The R, the R standard? The R number would vary from one table to the next. So they were all powers of 10. Uh, at least at this point. Uh, Reggio Montanus was the first to have a power of 10, and after him they were all powers of 10. And then finally at the end of this story, they've got a, this, this straightforward decimal point finally comes along and rescues everybody from this madness. All right, so how did Redicus do this? Well, how does one compute a sign table? We have some students of trigonometry here. You've all been memorizing the unit circle, am I right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there would not have been an engineering motivation at this time. It would have been astronomy. And I'm going to get to that. The second half of my talk goes exactly that direction. So, um, the very, some of the very basic signs, we all know what the sign of 45 degrees is, right? Or two over two. Thank you. Okay, you pass. Um, so there's some basic signs that are very easy. 36 degrees, maybe not so much, but it's not that hard. Well, okay, it's not that easy either, but we'll leave it at that. Um, using some basic trigonometric identities, the kind you learn in high school, um, you can build up more signs. If you know the signs of two angles, you can get the sign of the sum or the difference. And in fact, this is the reason these identities were invented in the first place, was to create sign tables. So eventually, you can use these identities and get the signs of every multiple of three degrees. But you'll notice that all, th all of the starting signs are all multiples of three degrees. And so it's actually impossible to use these identities to get the sign of one degree. About 160 years earlier, unfortunately not in Europe, but in Iran, a mathematician by the name of Jamshid al-Kashi had determined that you can get the sign of one degree from the sign of three degrees, but in order to do that, you have to be able to solve a cubic equation. Now, does anybody know when the cubic equation was solved? When? Cardano in 1545. Now, unfortunately, Al-Kashi didn't have Cardano because he hadn't been born yet. And he was living in a different culture. Um, however, Redicus did have Cardano nearby. And uh, De uh, Copernicus had died in 1543. Redicus actually went to visit Cardano. He knew Cardano was up to something that might help him with what he called the science of triangles. So Redicus knocks on Cardano's door and says, I hear you have something that can help me. Guess well, what, how Cardano reacted? <laughs> Slammed the door in his face and sent Redicus away empty-handed. Redicus then went into a depression that took two years for him to recover. He then went back to Germany, had a homosexual affair with one of his students, which never goes down well, um, and ended up fleeing and ended up living in the backwoods of Poland, believe it or not, not so far from where Copernicus had been. He's quite a character. 
All right, so in fact, Redicus managed to solve these tables, but through very little more than the ancient methods and a lot of hard work and some friends doing some very boring number crunching. But nobody followed Cardan uh, nobody followed Redicus's structure in, the, in, in any case. Eight years later, a Sicilian mathematician by the name of Francesco Morolico um, decided to follow not Redicus, not the newfangled stuff, but the older stuff from Reggio Montanus. And he said, well, Reggio Montanus had this tabula fecunda. I have found something that is just as good and I'm going to call it the tabula benefica, the beneficial table. And it turns out that this tabula benefica is the secant function. Okay, this is the first appearance of the secant other than Redicus's tables from seven years earlier. Now this caused a bit of a controversy because people knew what Redicus had done. And there, was a, there were accusations that Morolico had just simply taken one of Redicus's six tables and given it a fancy name and printed it and called it his own. That conflict, that, that um, plagiarism controversy, remained unresolved until last month. I kid you not. Where a colleague of mine and I were able to prove that Redicus, when he calculated the secant, used this obvious formula. And Morolico, when he calculated the secant, used this obvious, obvious formula. And it so happens that when the, co when the cosine numbers get very small, when, so when you get close to 90 degrees, round off error here gets magnified tremendously. And Redicus's values are actually much poorer than Morolico's values. So after 400 years, we have finally managed to vindicate Morolico's name. He did not copy Redicus's tables. OK. So we still have most people following Reggio Montanus, including Morolico. Then we've got Redicus over there. Nobody listens to him. So why, why do I keep mentioning Redicus if nobody ever followed him? Well, one person did, and he was the most famous mathematician of the 16th century, and no one has mentioned his name yet. Not Fibonacci. That was earlier. I'll give you a hint. It starts with a V, and it's not Van Brummelen. Viet. Francois Viet. What is Viet famous for? Algebra. Viet is, is known as the, the father of symbolic algebra. Why do you think Viet invented symbolic algebra? Pardon me? Precisely. All right, round of applause right here, folks. <laughs> Trigonometry was the reason that, that Viet invented his notations. He started as a trigonometer. And you're seeing his first book over there on the right. Yeah, you're right. OK. And if you look closely, I think only the people in the front row can read this. But you can see Redicus's notation, hypotenusa, basis, perpendiculum, and so on. So he actually has a set of tables that follows Redicus. But then he has some text that goes with these tables. And this text is wonderful. and unbelievably annoying at the same time. It's wonderful because it completely reinvents spherical trigonometry. In fact, planar trigonometry as well. It's frustrating because nobody can read a word of it. He's invented his own notation. I mean, some of you professional mathematicians know what happens when somebody, some, some guy works in his room for 20 years, never leaves the room, invents his own notation, gets this whole wonderful structure, and nobody knows what the heck he's talking about. That was Francois Viet. Nobody had a clue what he was up to. And it was brilliant. I'll just give you a brief hint as to his notation. Spherical trigonometry starts with a right angle triangle, uh, just like plane trigonometry does. But in spherical trigonometry, you actually have 10 
basic formulas for the spherical triangle. Not the mere couple that you have in plain trigonometry, and the reason is that spherical trigonometry is just plain better than regular trigonometry. <laughs> And here is the first appearance of those ten identities. They are, these ten identities are in this table right here. You are in no better or worse position than the people who were reading this in the 16th century to try to understand what this means. You can see some columns that say totus and sinus, others that say totus and fecundus. You might guess that fecundus means tangent, it does. These symbols in each row refer to a ratio. The, si the, the sine of C over the sine of AB is equal to the sine of A over the sine of CB. And you've got them all listed here. Somebody ask me what the crossouts are for. The crossouts cross actually do the same as in our language as putting a co in front of something. So it turns a sine into a cosine. It turns a tangent into a cotangent. Remember that back then, they still didn't have cosine. Viat has seen the structure and invented a notation that goes along with it. All right. Now, Viat had already composed his trig tables. You just saw them in his first publication, but it didn't stop him from working out some, working out further on this. Um, he did not know Al-Kashi. He ended up following the same road that Al-Kashi had followed, knowing that he had to find the sine of one degree and he had to solve a cubic to get it. Viat went a lot further. And when I say a lot further, I mean a lot further. He didn't stop at finding the sine of one-third of an angle that you started, cutting an angle into three pieces. He then worked out a way of finding the sign, a formula for the sine of 5 theta, which ended up producing not a cubic, but a quintic. He then worked out the sine of 7 theta, which produces a... What? I think it's called a heptic, isn't it? Or is, it's not called a septic. Don't tell me it's called that. <laughs> Okay, and sine of 9 theta, I have no idea how to, what you, nonic? Okay, we'll go with nonic. He actually did this for both the sine and the cosine and went up to the 21st term. He found a recursion relation. He had a lot of time. It actually, once you've got the recursion relation, it's not so bad. Uh, it's, well, okay, I mean, it takes months instead of years. Uh, and he's got the coefficients of the formulas tabulated here for the cosines. He seems to have done this for the pure, pure, pure joy of it. Um, he doesn't seem to have really used the more the higher level formulas for anything. But remember, he's got this symbolism. He's his colleagues didn't have this. Reggio Montanus could not possibly have done that. Because the only way you can get to that level of abstraction, that far advanced, is if you have a good system of notation. Viet had it. No one else did. In fact, Viet, when he ended up describing how to calculate sign tables, he used only the cubic and the quintic. The rest seems to have been just for his pure pleasure. So how did he solve quintics? How did he solve quintics? Uh, he didn't. <laughs> Good question. Um, he didn't. In fact, he didn't solve the cubic either, at least not directly in the way that we think of it. He had a numerical method that gave an approximation, which was basically just as good. Um, because he, these numerical methods that he had could get as accurate as you want just by taking them as far as you like. So that's just as good as having a direct formula. He seems to have had correspondence later in his career. 
Uh, earlier on, when he was doing some of these things, no, he was working on his own uh, with texts. Nobody really knew what he was up to. Once, once his work started to become published and was out there, then there were lots more, lots of people were starting to communicate with him because they recognized outside of the notation that he was brilliant. Um, and his, he, so he, people, a lot more people read him than he read other people. Okay. Now, so far, we've been talking mostly about pure mathematics. Mathematics up, or maybe mathematics up in the heavens. We've still been living in this separated world where the mathematics hasn't come down and entered the real world. This was a barrier that existed in a lot of fields. This is an image also illustrating this gap, not in mathematics, but in medicine. We have here the body, the person being operated on, maybe a cadaver. This is the physician up here. The physician is reading the ancient classical Greek text and is not even looking at the body. The surgeon is down here, clearly in a less exalted state, actually doing the dirty work. This, this, this same attitude was present in mathematics. There was a practical mathematics out there. It was an area called practical geometry, which you would use if you needed to build a cathedral or if you needed to do surveying and so on. But it was very, very simple mathematics. It involved similar triangles like you see here. It involved the Pythagorean theorem and not much more than that. Which means you get some pretty crazy stuff. If you don't have very much mathematics to work with, you want to work out the path of a cannonball, well, this is what a cannonball is going to have to do for you to be able to approach it. It's going to shoot straight out, it's going to run out of energy and stop, and then it's going to come straight down. Because that's what they do. Uh -huh. But this changed rather dramatically in the late 16th century. There are a lot of reasons why this might have changed. One of the reasons is that there was a class of people known as humanists who um, were trained with the classical texts, uh, but when they actually went out into the world and, apply and used their knowledge, they would use it in service of political masters for actual day-to-day -day things. So, in fact, this is the origin of liberal arts colleges. You study the classical texts, but you end up working day-to-day. And so the barrier between mathematics and the physical world was on the verge of breaking. It took a while. Here's a quotation from the first ever job interview for the civilian chair in geometry at Oxford. Um, Edmund Gunter, who we'll see again in a minute, invented a device for solving triangles called the Gunter Sector. So he was being interviewed by Henry Saville, the founder of the chair. So Gunter came and brought with him a sector and quadrant and fell to resolving the triangles and doing a great many fine things. Said the great knight, do you call this reading of geometry? This is showing of tricks, man. And so dismissed him with scorn and sent for Briggs on <laughs> Briggs eventually published an edition of Euclid. It would have been seen as much more than that if it was going to trade and all the stuff. Now this dam between these two areas for trigonometry actually broke rather hesitantly. This is a book from 1581 by Maurice Bressieux. <clears throat> practicing pronouncing that like Canadian, I was supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> 1581, he didn't feel he could bring the real world into trigonometry proper, and so he put this as an appendix at the end of the book, siphoned off away from everything else. Just one problem, finding the height of this castle, which was a standard problem in practical geometry. And he opens it, I don't know how many of you can read Latin, but that first phrase is, hoping that this will not be offensive to the reader. <laughs> Here's how you might use this elevated stuff to do stuff that maybe isn't quite so elevated. And we have here essentially the first story problem in trigonometry. Just one problem. It seems to have gone over pretty well. Two years later, 
Thomas Fink wrote perhaps the standard trigonometry textbook of his time. Um, it had 14 books in it, 14 chapters, of which one entire book was devoted to nothing but using trigonometry to solve surveying problems. Now it turns out that this book is also, I hate to go on it, uh, I'm not going to use it, I'm going to have to use one really corny pun. I'm going to go on it. I'm going to go on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> this same book of Thomas Fink is actually the first time that the word tangent appears in print. Up to now, it's been the title of the country. You can see it right here, the word tangent. And it's because the line defining the tangent is, in fact, tangent. Three pages later, you find the word secant. So Fink is fundamental in determining our language as well. Um, John Napier listed Fink as one of his most important influences. And what is Napier famous for? Logarithms. We'll get there soon. Now, the Fink and Brasier were also uh, the people who made the three standard fundamental trait functions standard and fundamental. What are the three standard fundamental trade functions? Sign? No. Those are not the standard trade functions. At least they weren't then. They are now. But <laughs> the standard trig functions that this, from this point onwards were not the sine, cosine, and tangent. They were the sine, the tangent, and the secant. Why these three? Exactly. You take a sine function and you read it backwards. What does it become? The cosine. You take a tangent function and read it backwards, cotangent. Take a secant function and read it backwards, cosecant. This is why those three functions have the cos in front of them and the other don't. I see all the middle school students saying, why didn't anybody ever tell me that before? That's all it is. These were the standard functions right through the 17th and even the 18th century. Okay. So back to the trigonometrists trying to convince people that they were actually useful. Bartholomew Petiscus, okay, maybe. This picture was actually drawn much, much later than his life, so you know it could have just been a guy in a wig that they thought might have looked like him. In the year 1595 or 1600, depending on how you're counting, he publishes this book called the Trigonometriae. This is the first appearance of the word trigonometry. Up till this point, it's been called the science of triangles or the doctrine of triangles. And you will notice that he very prominently puts in this cover page what this book is good for. It's good for geodesy. It's good for altimetry. It's good for geography. It's good for no, no monochorum. Can anybody take a guess as to what that is? Sundials. Sundials. Yes, it gets its own category and astronomy. And in a later edition, he actually added a chapter on architecture. And this book was so intensely emphasized uh, practical problems. In fact, this book is more than half applications. So it is completely transformed from this one little problem in 1581 to more than half the book in 1595. So you might ask the question then, well, did, these, did the practitioners really use this stuff? No, they didn't. We saw that away. It's not that, the, that they didn't see the use of it, but a lot of the practitioners, when they went home for the weekends, they weren't picking up trigonometry books to read. They were picking up 16th century Jean, uh, Dan Brown books. <laughs> so there wasn't a lot of buy-in from the practitioners. Then, so, so the trigonometers decided to go after them where they lived. This is a book I wish more people knew about. Christoph Clavius 
1604 said, okay, I'm going to go right down. I'm going to call my book Practical Geometry. So you're going to have to read it, and you're going to have to think it's important. Confusing the books you read. And this book starts with trigonometry. And it says, with trigonometry, I can solve all the problems that you solve, except I can do it better, I can do it more precisely, and I don't have to make as many measurements as you make. So my stuff is going to be better than yours. Part of the year for most of these guys. A um, lot of them uh, were from, uh, Clavius is, is Italian. A lot of them are from France, Germany, and as we're about to see, there's actually a lot of these that happen to them. Uh, but we haven't gotten to the English yet. We'll get that. <coughs> we almost done. Right. So, yeah. well, um, how much of a problem was it that all this stuff is in fact, in terms of penetrating to the practitioner? It, it made, and when it did, made when did it begin to change over? <laughs> in about five years from here. Uh -huh. Yeah, very, very soon. We're about to get to it. One of the major books that actually allowed the transition to happen was a translation of Petiscus's trigonometry into English, which was made by Richard Hansen in 1614. And uh, he did this for the sake of navigation, uh, which was a major aspect of English culture. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so Clavius writes this book. It completely transforms it, makes the theory more accurate. The problem is you still have to do the computation. You still have to take trigonom trigonometric numbers and work with them. <coughs> and this isn't just that practitioners couldn't multiply numbers. Yeah, they could multiply numbers. I mean, they're, not, they're not that dumb. They're doing similar triangles. They had to multiply numbers. The problem is, how accurately can you do it? And how, how, much, how prone to error is it when you do it? Let's consider a simple problem. This is going back to astronomy. So bear with me. I know this is practical, but it will illustrate the problem. Here we have the celestial sphere. Here is the equator of the celestial sphere. And here is the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the path that the sun travels around the sphere over the course of the year. Okay? They have an angle, a fixed angle, of 23 and a half degrees. And the most common problem in spherical astronomy is to say, is given the length of this distance here, which is determined by the day of the year, find how high the sun is above the equator, that distance belt. The standard formula for that is given down below right here. Now, this is set up for my birthday. So lambda is 60 degrees on May 20th, so that is my birthday, and that's the number we're going to work out. Does anybody happen to know the sun is 60 degrees? 0.866. Very good, except we needed a 10 decimal place. 866 followed by 70 degrees. Very good. We also know this number, the sine of 23 and a half degrees. We all know this to 10 decimal places, right? Point four something. <laughs> okay. So take these two numbers, you're going to have to multiply them together. Now you can't start shaving digits when you lose accuracy. So you have to multiply a 10 digit number by a 10 digit number to solve this problem. Okay, now, yeah, you could do it, but I'd like to see you try. <laughs> it's not as easy as, as it sounds and it's going to cause. People are going to make mistakes. They don't have Microsoft itself. This problem was resolved in a rather clever way by Kiko Brahe and his friends. Um, they used the power of trigonometry to solve this. This is an identity that students used to learn in school way back when, which I'm pretty sure none of you remember. Do you remember it for it? Very good. Okay. I never learned it in school. I had no idea it existed until I started studying this stuff. And you can see what it does. It takes a product of sines and turns it into a difference of cosines. It's a lot easier to take a difference than it is to take a product and it's more long. So Brahe had managed to work out this method. Well, it was probably one of Brahe's assistants, but that's no matter. Um, but this was within the context of astronomy. The ordinary day-to-day -day people were not using this. 
So what are you going to do? Enter a person who I earlier managed to reject. Do we remember Edmund Venter? Venter was part of the field of practical mathematics. He was working in England. He was especially interested in navigational problems. Um, he wrote this book. You can see the date here, 1620 or 1624. This was actually circulated much earlier than that, probably around 1605. This is crucial because I've said the last century before logarithms. Does anybody remember when logarithms were invented? I'll give you a hint. This is a very big year for logarithms. 1614. This year is the 400th birthday of logarithms. I, you must hold a lot of it on party at some point. Um, so this book was actually privately circulating earlier than logarithms. This is a Gunter sector. Um, if I had more time, I would actually show you how to use it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much more time. But this doc, this instrument is built to, design, to solve exactly the problem where you have one ratio equaling another ratio. In particular, ratios of signs. If you can look real closely, you can see a scale here that is actually marked out according to the sign of the angle. You can see the 8, 70, and 80, and 90 are all bunched up together. And there's another scale on the other side of the instrument that's exactly the same. And so how does it work out one ratio equal to another? Well, when you use the instrument, I won't go through the details because we don't have time, you actually end up forming similar triangles with the instrument. You actually hold it open and have a pair of compasses to transfer lengths, and you end up holding the instrument in such a position so that the length of the instrument 1 over the sine of 60 degrees is equal to the sine of 23 and a half degrees over what you now know must be the sine of this distance from the overall. It's very easy, it's very fast, and you can solve a difficult trigonometric problem in a matter of seconds. The answer is not going to be one that's very accurate, if you're using an instrument, but it's good enough for government. <laughs> All right, and we are now at the ease of logarithms. And why did logarithms come into existence? To solve exactly this problem. The reason logarithms exist is because of the identity that the log of a times b equals log of a plus the log of b. It turns a multiplication into an addition. Now, the person who first invented them, John Napier. You can see here's the book. I was actually holding this book in my hand earlier today. It's very tiny. Tell me what that is. Only about 100 pages. But I want you to look closely at the title. I'm going to point out a couple of things about it. I know the talk said it was a trigonometry before logarithm, but I'm up here and I can make the rules. The miraculous, a description of the miraculous table of logarithms with uses in both kinds of trigonometry. What kinds are those? Plain and spherical. Oh, and by the way, and also in other sorts of calculations. You may have heard that the pure logarithms are not the same as our logarithms. And that's true for a couple of reasons, not just the standard reason. Um, he designed his logarithms to deal with ratios that you get when solving spherical triangles. Uh, exactly the ratio you just saw. And if I had more time, I would show it to you, but I'm not going to because I don't have the time. Um, so it appeared was especially interested in spherical trig. In fact, this book on logarithms has 20 pages describing logarithms, and the rest of the book is all pretty much. This is why he invented this theory. It wasn't until after Napier died, which was about three years later, that modern logarithms came along. Um, when they wanted to kind of 
keep the trigonometry, but blow up this other stuff and allow logarithms to be used for more than just trigonometry. So, the last century before logarithms then was one of the most crucial centuries, not just in the history of math, but in the history of science itself. I mean, the theory of trigonometry, as you can see, is completely transformed from Reggio Montanus with just the sign, the first sign, into this huge system, which was even starting to work a little bit towards analysis, especially in the work of the But most importantly, this is the century where the barrier between mathematics and the physical world broke. And that's the main lesson here. This is the century where mathematics became the engine of science. It's not calculus that did it, it is trigonometry. Right. This is the century, very early, not long after logarithms came along, that you heard this famous quote from Galileo, which you write hundreds of times, mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. And I'd like to think it was trigonometry that allowed him to make this statement. 